The Answer. All right, folks, welcome back to Gun Owners Radio. FM 96.1, AM 1170. The answer. It is yours, my friend. Quick turn All right. Page. When it comes to... When it comes to the Second Amendment, the NRA focuses on the national level. We focus on city and county level. But what about the in-between at the state level? Next is Sam Paredes from Gun Owners of California. All right, but first, you have legal matters that involve, or if you have legal matters that involve firearms, then you need to call California Firearms Lawyer, John Dillon. You have questions about, say, red flag laws, gun registration, gun transportation, or maybe you, you need to know that your guns are even California compliant. Call our trusted firearms attorney, John Dillon. John Dillon specializes in California gun laws. Just call him at 760 642 7150. Or you can visit his website at DylanLawGP.com. All right, everybody. So Gun Owners of California is a fantastic organization um, that uh, makes sure to defend your Second Amendment rights right here in California. They are no compromise. They're hard-hitting. And I got to tell you, um, I'm a huge fan. And one of the, one of the best best things about Gun Owners of California is Sam Paredes. He's the guy that, that basically runs it. He's got a whole crew that helps him, but he he, he runs uh, Gun Owners of California and does an excellent job. Truly a gentleman, a scholar, and someone I'm a big fan of. Uh, Sam, are you there? I am here, and uh, you are way too kind. I appreciate the... Uh... <laughs> The, the very kind words. Absolutely. Very all sincere. I truly am a big fan. Um, I think that you just do, do an excellent, excellent job, and I appreciate everything that you do, Sam. Well, thank you very much. It's a honor and a pleasure to do what uh, what we do. Um, the Second Amendment is an important thing for our society, for our country, for freedom and liberty, and we've dedicated our lives to do that. So we're a team. Awesome. Is the So now, to, for, for people that aren't familiar in, in, down in San Diego, tell everybody about Gun Owners of California. What, 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 what do you, you know, talk a little bit about the history, because I think it's, it's fascinating, mm-hmm. and then tell us a little bit about what, what, you know, what role you guys play. Well, Gun Owners of California is actually the oldest pro-gun political action committee in America. Yeah. In 1975, when political action committees were invented by Congress and the California State Legislature, Senator H.L. Richardson, who served the legislature in California as a senator for 22 years, uh, he was on the, the uh, board of directors of the National Rifle Association, and he, he went to the board and said, hey, guys, they're trying to ban handguns in California. I'm going to start one of these new pacts, um, and I just want to let you know. And they said, oh, go ahead and do it. Well, he, he started it, and it was so effective so quickly that they immediately started the uh, Institute for Leg- Legislative Action and, and the Political Victory Fund and, and, and started their um, political action committee. So um, since 1975, when they first tried to pass laws in California to ban handguns, uh, we've been fighting, uh, no compromise, from 1975 to uh, probably 19... 19- uh, well, all the way through the 80s, uh, the, we actually gave more money to candidates, uh, pro-gun candidates, than the Republican Party gave to candidates in the state wow. of California to help elect conservatives. And from, again, 1975 to 1989, uh, there were no gun control laws passed in the state of California. Uh, we, we were able to defeat them um, just by the mere threat of, of us challenging uh, elected officials at the at the ballot box, and and of course everybody knows 1989 with the uh, then Governor George Duke Machen and the uh, the passage of the assault weapons ban, they kind of broke the dam. And also at that time, the state legislature changed the way that political action committees could um, participate in the, in the political arena, and and where in the past uh, gun owners' money might have provided half of the budget that some candidates needed to for, for election uh we were li- limited to you know, four thousand at the time four thousand one hundred dollars and now it's close to five thousand dollars that we can give to any one candidate which isn't enough money to pay for half of a district-wide mailer in the assembly or the senate so they they worked very hard to defeat us we um we have some pretty our, our, our trophy board is pretty impressive uh 
Uh, at one time, the dean of the legislature, Senator Al Rada, who was a dem- radical Democrat, uh, had served for forever. And uh, we took him out. We defeated him uh, with a young guy named um, John Doolittle in the state Senate. And that just ticked them off. They had to figure out how to limit our ability to participate and be successful in, in the political arena. So now we've we've changed the way we do things. And, and now we go through uh, grassroots activity and, and, and information to, to pro-gun uh, um, you know, gun owners out there and um, participation in court cases uh, and, and lobbying the legislature. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing history. And, and all along, um, it's been no compromise. Uh, we, we are a committee uh, against gun control and for crime control. And those are two vastly different things. And, and that's, that's kind of our motto. Well, and I, I can't tell you the, the the feedback I get from people, elected officials who serve in Sacramento, on how much respect they have for you personally, Sam, and the work that that uh, Gun Owners of California does is amazing. I mean, I really, truly, uh, you know, we're we're a we're kind of a Johnny Come Lately organization, the San Diego County Gun Owners, right? We we just started, and we're 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 doing our very best, and we're, we I feel like we're doing an okay job. But I'll talk to people, you know, hey, here's who I am, here's what we do, you know, elected officials, yeah. I'm talking from Sacramento, and they go, oh, you know, uh, I, I know Sam, I know Sam, like they brag about it. <laughs> I know Sam, and, and uh, you know, they we did this together, and we did that together, and, and uh, you know, a lot of respect for gun owners of California from, from friend and foe in Sacramento, mm. uh, and that's earned, man, that's not given. Well, you know, first of all, um, <laughs> what San Diego County gun owners is doing uh, is following the the uh, roadmap that Senator Richardson laid out uh, for any group to be con- uh, successful, whether it's gun related or anything else. And you, you folks, uh, kudos to you. And and um, you know there are some people that are afraid of new groups being involved and and concerned about it. And and I always counsel them, hey, you need to relax. Anybody who is successful at doing something is not slicing the pie into thinner slices. They are actually growing the pie. And as long as you continue to do what you do well and continue to grow under your dynamic, that's a beautiful thing. Don't worry about other organizations and people who have got it, you know, the the the, the motivation to organize, to to fund and to, to be involved in the political arena. Uh, be, be encouraging. And, and, and that's just the attitude that we've always had. So we don't view anybody in the arena as a competitor unless they choose to uh, uh, be very negative towards what we do, in which case we just roundly ignore them and, and uh, you know, and just do our thing. Um, as long as you stay on the no compromise um, narrow ridge, and never step off the path. You never have to worry about it. Uh, you know, what people have said, what you've said, it, it's it's always on that no compromise um, path, and and that's where we where we operate. So, uh, you know, shoot, I appreciate just being able to talk with you guys and encourage you to continue doing what you're doing, and 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 not view anybody as competition, and. and you know, just continue to spread the word. We, there are so many millions of gun owners in California, and, and we are just scratching the surface and communicating with them. So, um, uh, well, those aren't just power to everybody. Thank you. And those aren't just words, Sam. You, man, without you guys, we would not exist. You guys were enormously yeah. supportive, and I'm a very, very appreciative. And you guys I can't tell you how much I, I appreciate how much you guys do. How, now, you personally, Sam, how did you get into mm-hmm. gun? Well, why is the Second Amendment important to you, Sam? Not not just not well, just what you do for a living, but how did you get into it? Yeah, it, it was a it definitely a God thing. You know, I was a, a kid who grew up in East Los Angeles, and um, you know, m- most of the kids that grow out of there come with a left-leaning perspective. Uh, I, I did not. I was blessed with a mother and father who, as immigrants, as green card holders, were supportive of uh, Governor Ronald Reagan, and and um, you know, they they didn't like taxes. They didn't like government intrusion, and they uh, taught us the straight and narrow, and and uh, taught us respect and and a, a healthy, um, you know, uh, they they kept us in church and and gave us the path to follow. 
And um, then I was blessed to go to uh, Pepperdine University for my college education. Uh, my choices were USC, UCLA, Loyola, Pepperdine. I walked on that campus and said, this is where I'm going. It was the best decision of my life because that's where I met my future wife, uh, Lori Richardson, who just happened to be daughter of Senator H.L. Richardson. And um, uh, Senator Richardson shaped my life more than than anybody. And he and, and Barbara Richardson, my mother-in-law, uh, future mother-in-law, really guided uh, and challenged me to think critically about my political perspectives and why I believe what I believe. And it was easy. Um, and uh, after working in, as a campaign manager with my wife, Lori, in 1980 in um, Monterey County for a guy named Eric Seastrand, who was running for state senate, we lost the county by 700 votes. Mm. Um, Senator Richardson invited me to come to, to, to Sacramento and be a, a field rep for gun owners in, at the end of 1980. And um, except for a couple of stints with a couple of governors and running a, a rifle manufacturing company. I had been an employee or uh, a member of the board of directors since 1980 of California. And I'm telling you, I'm, when you understand that defense of the Second Amendment is not about saving guns, it's about saving lives, it's about saving freedom and liberty, you know, for every time that we are successful in fighting back a gun control measure, we know that we are saving lives because there are only about 12 to 15, 16,000 people that are murdered with guns by a criminal every year. The number of deaths with guns uh, on an annual basis is somewhere between 30 and 34,000. More than half of those are suicide, so those aren't criminal act against another person. The number of actual homicides is down, uh, you know, 12 to, to, to 15,000 every year. There are 3 million times a year law-abiding citizens in America use guns to successfully defend themselves. Yeah. That doesn't and get talked about side, enough. That does not get talked yeah. about enough. Yeah. Yeah. If the other side were successful in taking guns away of those uh, from those 3 million people, how many of those people would be victims instead of survivors? And they're okay with that. They're okay with their, you know, going right. from 15,000, you know, uh, homicides to millions of homicides. Hey. Nice. <laughs> I thought so. See, I've got yeah. to the page. Hey, have you ever uh, dreamed to be a pilot? I mean, come on. I have. Yeah, me too. But no more than a double winger. Tail dragger. That dream comes true at San Diego Flight Training International. We are so excited to welcome San Diego Flight Training International as a new sponsor. You can learn to fly, start an adventure of a lifetime, and right in the heart of San Diego. Where? Where? Montgomery Field. Getting started super easy. 858-569-1822. Learn to fly at SDFTI. But give them a call, 858-569-1822. Make an appointment and just go for a little walk around and get, get a feel for the place. Could be the best thing you ever do did all right let's get back to sam yeah sam Perez from gun owners of california sam we were talking about hl richardson the uh the founder of gun owners of california and he wrote a book that i'm particularly fond of what was the what was the name of the book he wrote well he actually wrote several but i think the one you're referring to is uh confrontation politics it's a book yep. not about you know how to scream in somebody's face louder and more effectively in politics but the understanding of how confrontation works in politics and how you can become effective at um, winning yeah. and, and, and moving your agenda forward and how to view uh, intellectually, how to understand the media, how to understand elected people, how to understand politicians and, and, and grassroots and an encouragement or, or a model for <laughs> what you guys have done. Yep. That's uh, why I bring it up. An organization, uh, building an organization, uh, figuring out how to, to, to make it successful and growing it. And, you know, uh, the, the, his message was, listen, the other side, the hardcore leftists, they eat, breathe, sleep, drink, um, politics. They, they are selected. They're put into foundations or unions and, and, and positions to be trained 
to be in the political arena. Um, uh, our people are people who enjoy their families, their avocations, their vocations, their churches, their friends, their hobbies. And that's where we would prefer to spend all of our time as opposed to the leftists who their avocation, their vacations, their pleasure is being involved in the political uh, uh, leftist arena. So our people don't have the time or don't dedicate the time to be involved. So it's incumbent upon us to understand that and say, okay, if we can't be involved and go to Sacramento to lobby or to be involved in elections and to study and research and participate and and to write briefs to the courts uh, in in a manner to where um, they are effective, we need to at least put some money in the in a pot to hire somebody who is dedicated to doing that on our behalf. And it's not just them doing it; they are representing more and more and more and hundreds and then thousands and then hopefully hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of people uh, in in a professional manner to reflect their views. That's what a republic is. You you organize to to appoint or hire or elect somebody who represents your views because we have a lot of other things that we would rather do than be in politics. And and that's what you guys have done and I'm I'm awfully proud of that and that's kind of our model. And that's what confrontational politics is. Yeah, confrontational politics. Absolutely. If you read that book, and I encourage everybody to read that book, you're. It, it, it's we 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 stole all our moves. We stole all our moves from mm-hmm. that book, proudly, by mm-hmm. the way, which was the intent of the book. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's it's really really well done. Um, and it's kind of the you know it's kind of the rules for radicals. For the other side of the politi- political spectrum, mm-hmm. and, and I th- and I think it's actually even it's 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 been I've read and and actually really like and have stolen things from Rules for Radicals. It, it, it talks a lot about how to organize people, but uh, confrontational politics is way better, far more intellectual, mm-hmm. far more um, far more uh, practical, um, and mm-hmm. uh, I, I highly encourage everybody to pick that book up. Um, do you do you guys sell that, or, or should they just get it on Amazon? No, you you can call our office at nine one six nine eight four one four zero zero or uh, go to our website gunownersca.com, dot com and we have it in our store. Or you can call us and we can send it to you. Um, it, it, we're to the point of uh, uh, not self publishing. We actually have the. Um, um, uh, one of the Insti- leadership institute uh, back east, who's who's been publishing the book, and we get copies and and distribute them to anybody who wants them. Um, we can have, you know, if somebody wants to have a conversation with their organization about competitional politics, I give workshops on competitional politics throughout the country uh, to, to kind of, um, you know, put word voice to to, to the message. But uh, yeah, awesome. but it's easy to get. It's timeless. It is timeless. Yeah. It absolutely is timeless, and that actually brings me to what I want. So I, I, I don't, I can't really, I don't know anybody else right now that I could interview who has been fighting for the Second Amendment in California for forty years. I think, I think you're, I think you're, you're like the last man standing, Sam. <laughs> um, how, <laughs> how is that? <laughs> I don't know if that was flattering. It was meant to be. <laughs> I was thinking about that. It, yeah. it, it was. T- Totally accepted. It's very, very humbling and fat, flattering. Good. I, I think and, and, and realistic. realistic. Well, no, I don't think anybody else is tough enough to stay in the arena for forty years. So that's really what I was trying yeah. to get to. But how, how have things changed in, in those forty years? And specifically, how have things changed in you know in like the last ten or fifteen years when it comes to activism and, and the Second Amendment in California? Well, um, that's a, that's just a. A brilliant question. It's a great question, and it, and it is a pretty complex question. Back when gun owners was was started in in 1975, in 1982, um, we actually had oh golly, uh, over a hundred thousand members in the state of California, people who were contributing to the fight. And then in 1982, when Prop 15 was put on the ballot and handguns. Um, we skyrocketed. Uh, all of the organizations were on fire when we fought that thing, and we had virtually every law enforcement agency in the state of California uh, opposing Prop 15, and, and we defeated it two to one. Uh, 
uh, even though the media said two weeks before, actually two days before the election, that we were going to lose two to one. We actually won two to one. So after we defeated the handgun ban on the ballot, what do gun owners do? They say, we won, yeah. and we don't have to worry about it anymore, and, and they, they dropped off. Yep. And then we've been continuing to fight to 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 say, hey, the fight is still out there. There's still things to come. And finally, after 1989, when the um, assault weapons ban was signed by Governor Duke Mage, and people said, oh, these guys were serious all along. We, we do have to constantly fight to protect the Second Amendment. And it's been a battle ever, ever since. And more recently, the legislature and the, the left of them have gotten a very good at trying to figure out every way possible to make it more difficult for us to to operate in the political arena, limiting how we can participate, how much money we can spend, how we can spend it. Uh, but you know what? We always figure out a way to to uh, um, you know go along around the barn and and and, and be able to participate in, a, in an effective manner. Uh, and and we we've, we've gone to the to the streets grassroots and and they can't stop us from doing that and it's and you know now we get our folks to understand who it is who the good folks are and who are working for office and then we encourage our folks to support those people directly uh, instead of sending it from governors of California we encourage all our members throughout the state to support these key races and send them a thirty five dollar check in, instead of and send it to our pack, and then we send it to somebody, send it directly to them, and continue to support these candidates. Uh, and, and even though somebody up in Northern California, Redding, California, you know, we're asking them to send a $35 check to a candidate down in San Diego County, they we encourage them to understand that by electing that pro-gun, conservative, uh, 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 Second Amendment supporter, they even though they reside in, in San Diego County, they represent your views in the state legislature, and that's the important thing. And our members are, are, are pretty sophisticated in understanding that. So that takes the leftists off, that, that we've been able to hoodwink them, uh, even though they're trying to limit us as, as to how much money we can directly give to a candidate. And so, we, you know, fine. Uh, liberty is, is way too vibrant uh, and, and and we will always find a way to express it, and and that's what we're, we've done. The leftists have gotten harder left. They are doing everything they can, as you well know, to not only control guns but to eliminate guns and to vilify those of us who are are, are, are choose to be gun owners and, and carry firearms for protection of ourselves, our homes, our travels, our businesses, our country. They really, truly um, have. I, it really has. It's almost like they're they're running out of of extreme ideas. We, we talk about a little bit. We we just have, uh, but we have like two two and a half minutes left. Okay. Talk about the um the the uh, they're trying to go after manufacturers. T- t- give us right. everything you want. You can say on that. Okay, really quickly. Um, they know that they cannot ban manufacturers from making guns. What they're trying to do right now is make it easy for absolutely anybody, for any reason whatsoever, to sue firearms manufacturers in order to uh, bankrupt them out of existence. They are giving. They know that none of these lawsuits will be successful, but the fact they are forcing. Uh, gun manufacturers to go to court and defend themselves. Their expectation is that they're going to run them out of business just by 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 follow, you know, filing lawsuits. And they are uh, they're giving permission to anybody to come up with any reason whatsoever because they don't like an ad that, that showed up in a gun magazine because they don't like the fact that that manufacturers are supporting youth shooting teams. Um, don't like. That they're that they're uh, dedicating guns for for women uh, to, that are practical for them to to use as a as a market, and so they're giving them opportunities to sue them, and that is just plain that is a strategy that they're using because everything else has failed, and and you know they're they're extreme, they're desperate, and pulling out all the stops. Truly. Uh, wh- where should people go? Talk about if people. I truly think everybody should join Gun Owners of California. Send them the, uh, the the donation to to become a member. Where should they go, Sam? Go to our website at gunownersca.com. You can Google Gun Owners of California. Um, uh, call us at nine one six nine eight four one four zero zero. We'd love to have you on the team and and provide you 
As we say, we'd like to keep our members and supporters armed and informed mm-hmm. so that we can defend, protect, and restore the Second Amendment. Thank you, Sam. Truly appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot, man. We surely Anytime. do. All right. All right. Who's, who's missing the? Two I don't know. Now? You know Charlie Cook. I do. Charlie Cook. Next, who's Charlie, Charlie Cook? Cook riding shotgun with Charlie. Awesome guy. Coming up. Here we go. All right, folks. Hey, does it take too much time to clean your guns? Clean, lube, and protect your guns faster with Seal One. Seal One CLP Plus is natural, non-toxic, and environmentally friendly, and it tastes good too. No, I'm only kidding. Hey, clean your guns faster and easier. One and done with Seal One. Ask for it by name at your local gun shop or tell them to go get it. But anyway, go go on the website. That works too. Seal1.com. That's seal1number1.com. Hey, who is this guy, Charlie? So we should have Charlie Cook. Charlie, are you out there? Yeah, he's out uh, there. I am here. All right. So we got Charlie Cook from Riding Shotgun with Charlie, which is a, a really cool concept. I, I discovered him. Uh, I was looking on my, my Substack stack. Um, page one day and i saw a new subscriber it's riding shotgun with charlie i'm thinking what the heck is that and uh went and checked it out it's really cool so charlie who is charlie cook and what is riding uh shotgun with charlie well thanks guys i am um i by day i am a a lowly band teacher but on uh on the off school hours uh i film riding shotgun with charlie around the country and i i talk to pro gun folks about what it is that they do and what they do in the gun community and whether they're instructors or uh, authors or activists or if they've um, uh, they've gone from being a victim of a crime and became, you know, went from a non-gun person or a gun agnostic to a pro-gun person. So, and, and how did you come up with that? Because, uh, you know, you were saying you're a, a band, uh, a music teacher, actually, and a musician. And how do you evolve from that to riding shotgun with Charlie? How would you get that going? Uh, well, I, um, I I was I was a gun agnostic myself growing up. In in 2001, I had my son, and uh, also you know we had that disastrous day in 2001, and that that was a turning point for me because I realized that we do live in a dangerous world, and there are people that want to harm us and our American way of life. And I have this little precious little boy that I need to protect, and in order for me to protect him. In order for me to raise him, I need to be around, and I need to be able to protect myself so that I can protect him. And that's kind of kind of when the gun ownership started. I was teaching in a school, and uh, we had a meeting with the principal, and he said, if anyone gets in the school that's not supposed to be there, he would get on the intercom and say that um, uh, the eagle has landed, and everyone should lock their doors and hide under their desks. And I sat in the room with the teachers, and I'm like, look, I'm in another building, and I don't have desks in my room. So this doesn't really work for me. And I told all the teachers, I said, look, if if all the teachers on the first floor of the building had guns, they could shoot the bad guys. And the teachers on the second floor can keep on teaching. We need half the grief counseling and, half, you know, half all of that stuff. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And our next school vacation, I went out and pursued getting a gun license. Well, and just just for context, too, you're you're located in which state out there? <laughs> I'm in occupied territory, yeah. very much like you guys. I'm in uh, on the opposite end. Yeah, the corner. I'm in Massachusetts. Yeah, so you're in the East Coast version of California, basically. So <laughs> yeah, how did, I'm very. So very much I was so. going to ask you. So go ahead. So that that inspired you to start. Where did you start with gun wise? <laughs> so I um I got a uh, I became a uh, card carrying NRA member before I had a gun license, and uh, after I got a gun license, I remember reading the armed citizen articles and talking to my mother and I said, Hey, this gun stuff is kind of cool. I think I want to get into this. And my mom said, why don't you come back to the Midwest and get your dad's guns? And I'm like, Oh, I didn't even know we had guns in the house. So I drove out to the Midwest. I did all the things I probably, I don't know if the statute of limitations has passed, but (laughs) (laughs) I did all the things I probably shouldn't do. Uh, I drove out to the Midwest. I brought back a couple of guns that were family guns. And and then I did, the, uh, in Massachusetts, we don't have gun registration. We have transfer registration. And I wanted to be a good little doobie at the time. So I let the state of Massachusetts know that I inherited these firearms. And, and I had a gun license, and I could own them. So I, I went from owning no guns to owning two shotguns, uh, one twenty two semi-auto target pistol, and one little replica of a sharp four-barrel Derringer. Wow, I just saw an article on one of those, too. That's a, that's a cool-looking little gun. 
I thought, but the uh, the shotguns though. I I heard uh, that you're like a big uh, wing shooter. Is that true? <laughs> I'm not sure about that, <laughs> but um, I the, the so the way this this worked with riding shotgun is, um, you know, over the years I became a uh, became a gun instructor. You know, being a teacher, I like teaching, so I became a gun instructor, and and I was actually in Toastmasters for a number of years, and I was working on some manuals that were called communicating on video. And one of the uh, one of the projects was to interview someone in a talk show format and be interviewed by someone in a talk show format. Then there was to a press conference, make a video on how to help people with speeches and uh, do an editorial video. So in the process of doing all of this, I decided that I, you know, I like watching carpool karaoke and I, I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to hang out with rock stars. So I see this this chubby guy that's English. And uh, he's hanging out with rock stars. So I said, hey, I'm chubby and I speak English. I can probably do what he's doing. And, and I parlayed the uh, the carpool karaoke into uh, into riding shotgun with Charlie. So and how do you how did you start off with? Because I, I was, uh, you know, looking at some of your videos and stuff. And you've talked to some of the, uh, you know, some of the um, luminaries, I guess, in our community here with guns. I, I've seen uh, a bunch of really good ones on there. And so how did you, did you start out with that? Did you go right to the top or did you work your way up uh, with those people or how did that, how did that go? What was the first couple of rides? The, the, the first few people I had were like, my, I t talked to my mentor. I talked to uh, one of the guys I used to play in a band with. I called up one of my gun instructors that lives in Western Massachusetts. And I said, Hey, I'm trying this new thing out. And, and, you know, I want to interview people in the car and would you be willing to be in the show? Um, so I just interviewed some local folks. I eventually reached out to a friend, uh, a friend's husband, who, uh, who was a victim of a crime. Uh, he was held at gunpoint for twenty dollars, uh, in like in his, you know, at his apartment complex. And his uh, his name was Lee Michaels, and he's a, 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 a radio personality in Minneapolis. So I reached out to him and I said, "Hey, I'm doing this new thing. I'm interviewing people in the car. Um, would you be interested in being on the show?" And he's like, "Yeah, that sounds great." So I went out to Minneapolis, and he said, if you come out this weekend, Mark Walters from Armed American Radio is going to be here, and you can interview Mark Walters. So I interviewed – before then, I interviewed Ken Blanchard, the black man with a gun, and Anthony Calandra from the Gun for Hire range. And um, I did that over the summer, and then a month later, I was in Minneapolis, and Mark Walters is like, hey, this is really cool. How can we do some – you know, I want to help you with this. And I'm like, I don't really know what that means, but that sounds really cool. So – a month later, um, he well, actually later that week, he asked me if I'd speak in a month at the Gun Rights Policy Conference in Tampa that year. And I'm like, yeah, of course. And then I got to hang out with all the cool, you know, the cool gun folks that I didn't know. I've only seen them online. And I get to uh, get to talk with them and hang out with them. And, you know, next thing I know, I'm, I'm speaking at a Florida carry event. And, and Masada Yub is one of the speakers. And I'm interviewing Masada Yub in Florida. Yeah, and that was because uh, I noticed that too. Because um, you know, I was looking at some of those people. I, I watched your um, your interview with uh, with Hickok forty five, who I would love to talk to here. Yet we just haven't gotten around to him. But mm -hmm. um, got a lot of good people like that. And one of our listeners was asking, um, like, who's on your radar? Who are you uh, really looking uh, forward to trying to get in the car with you? Oh my gosh! So so I am coming out for for gun prom in June. And nice. I, so uh, Joe Dramisi then's on the head of that list. That's good. <laughs> you got it. I, you're on the list, and Michael's on the list, of course. Um, but this is a long shot. I I love Adam Carolla, so I reached out to his people. Um, I actually did a gun gram where I played the trumpet and shoot a gun, and he played it on his uh, on his podcast, and and I got to read ping pong balls to him here in, at a uh, at a, a place in Boston. So I'm, you know, I've, I've emailed his producer. And I, I said, hey, I'd love to get Adam Carolla on my show. And he's like, well, let me pass it on to his agent. But I know that's, you know, that's shooting for the stars. Okay, um, can I do my riding shotgun on the way to Adam Carolla? On the way to gun? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's do it, man. All right, yeah. Hey, and if he great. could hook him up, then you have to give him the seat. Oh, maybe that's what I'll do. Because you know people. <laughs> you know people. I don't know Adam Carolla. Well, I saw him in a, I saw him in a drugstore once. Like How hard years. is it to get a hold of Adam Carolla? He doesn't well, apparently like all you got to do is hang out in a drugstore in L.A. That's where I saw him first off. So maybe I'll just go <laughs> back to that. Or he'll be at a hot rod shop because he's a real car guy. I've heard that, he's too. He's a car guy. Yeah, he is a car guy. So. Oh, yeah, he's raced the Long Beach Grand Prix celebrity race. 
I think he won it, if I'm not mistaken, from the celebrity side. Yeah, he's quite the guy. Yeah. So he's, I mean, he's not a gun guy, but he's like, you know, swinging for the, uh, you know, swinging for the rafters there. He's level headed. Um, he's a, he's, he's, he's a conservative. We could say it. I mean, I mean, he gets the second amendment. And he gets gun ownership. Totally. I, I think he's actually a big libertarian, isn't he? Is he a lib- yeah. I think he's a bit more libertarian than he is conservative. I, know, I, I, I think he's actually been. He's I, the reason I say that is I think he was like a guest, um, uh, a guest speaker for like the Libertarian Party at one point. Uh, but anyway, I didn't mean to. I didn't yeah. mean to. I didn't mean to turn it into the Adam Carolla interview. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was, no, no, I got no, excited. That's totally, cool. <laughs> that's totally cool. So the, I mean, you know, the other crazy people uh, that I'd like to get on the show that aren't uh, aren't necessarily gun folks. I'd love to get like Hank Williams Jr. and uh, Kid Rock, and I'd love to get Ted Nugent in the car. Like these are these are the people that are on the dream list. You know what I mean? Wow, it's a great yeah. list. It is, and and then I've you know I've I've been very fortunate that you know I get to to meet guys like you and talk to you guys and get you guys on the show, which is awesome. Um, and uh, you know I the the thing with Hickok forty five, I I messaged him and said, hey, I'm coming down to Tennessee. I'd like to do a show. And he's like, well, I'm going to be down in Florida. And I'm like, well, maybe another time. He's like, okay. And I, I, went, I had to take my daughter. My daughter goes to college in Nashville. So we went to go visit the college he goes to. I called him up, and he said he'd be willing to do it. Hey, you know, a lot of companies are so frustrated with their website. Well, it looks old. It's hard to update. You know, it's not really generating any leads. Well, SageTree gets it. Since 2005, SageTree has been helping companies with websites that look great, work great, and get leads. Stop being embarrassed by your website and get one that you're proud to share. Contact Sage Tree today to get a website that makes the phone ring. Getting started is super easy. Go to sagetree.com and schedule a call. That's go to sagetree.com, press the schedule, a call button. All right, we got Charlie Cook. All right, we're back, back in the house. Okay, Charlie, I'm... You want me to do it? You can, yeah, you can do it if you want. I, yeah, okay, Charlie, I have to do it because I'm the car guy. All right. There's a lot of discussion about the stagecoach, Charlie. So go ahead. Well, Sarah. if you're going to take all these really, really influential you know, movers and shakers, what kind of car do you drive? When I started the show, I had a 2010 Nissan Sentra. <laughs> I was so close. <laughs> you weren't even near. He had you in a Toyota Corolla. Oh, no, Tercel. I, oh, Tercel. I, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you go give it? Do you give it a bath first, and then go pick these people up, or is well, it? Well, as I, well a, I think you drive something else now, though. Oh yeah, what do you drive now? What'd you move uh, up right to? Now, I moved up to a uh, a 2014 Dodge Charger. Oh, okay. <laughs> a a, a hush the, falls over the crowd. A three five or a five seven V six or V eight? The V six. Well, come oh, on. three six. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so never it's, mind. It's small, All right. It's, it's over. Drive, it's, it's over. It's, We're you done. Know, I know. But I you know, know what? I know. <laughs> It'll be a classic someday. You find that hard to believe, but trust me, in 50, 60 years, something will be a classic. In 50 or 60 years, it might be paid off. <laughs> <laughs> Give or take in this state of California. All right, Joe, continue on. Well, yeah. So I was going to ask Charlie about the, because uh, he was on stage with Adam Carolla. I, I didn't want to set Michael off again, but I, I was, I, I'm curious now, because I guess he was on stage with, uh, was it you and Adam and a pregnant woman and something else up there? Yeah. So he was doing this thing. Uh, you know, one of the things that Adam does is, is he he has this segment that he used to call "What Can't Adam Complain About," and the, he parlayed that into um, Adam Carolla is unprepared because he's you know he's got plenty of things he's worked up about. So what he did is he was he was going around the country. He had a ping pong ball hopper. He had the audience write one word on the ping pong ball, and he needed people on stage to pull ping pong balls. So I sent him the gun gram of Maneater, which is a song that he hates. And and I said, listen, I, I, I should be the guy that pulls, pulls the ping pong balls in, in Boston. So I, it was a Friday afternoon. I get a I get, I get an email from his producer, and he's like, hey, you're in the contender. You're one of the contenders for uh, pulling ping pong balls. Can you call in this afternoon? So I, I had to like go in late to school. You know, I had some lessons after school. So I, I called my uh, colleague that I work with. I'm like, look, I'm going to be late. I don't know when I'm going to be in, but I'll be there. Um, so it was between me and this pregnant woman who was going to take her husband uh, and his buddy, and they were going to go drink too much. And um, the the greatest, the coolest thing to me is, is uh, she talked and I talked and we answered some questions and whatnot. 
And then, uh, then Adam Carolla says, how can you say no to these two great Americans? He's like, let's have both of you come up on stage. Ah, cool. So you see, Mike, can you play Man Eater on something, Michael? That that could be a way in. I, I'll see what I can do. I'll. I don't know. I'm not even sure. <laughs> that is so funny. So I like. I I, I have a couple right? guns. Maybe they. You know. You never know. Stranger things. Yeah. You maybe. know the other thing too is because Charlie's done so many cool things here. It's it's very interesting if you you check him out. But he uh, he's also a big speaker on the steps of the Supreme Court. Got a chance to do that too, which I wanted to hear about. Yeah, so I so it was 2018. It was Heller 10. Uh, it was the anniversary of Heller 10, and the Second Amendment Institute organized a speech on the Supreme Court steps. Um, Amanda Suffolk was speaking. Uh, Cheryl Todd was speaking. Thomas Massey was speaking. Ma Sheree was speaking. So I'm like, hey, these are these are people I know. These are my friends. This is a big deal. I'm going to go down. And um, Ted Cruz was supposed to be one of the speakers and this was, you know, 2018. So I was, uh, I was looking forward to hearing Ted Cruz speak. So I'm right down front getting pictures, getting video. Amanda comes over to me and she's like, Hey, come here for a second. I'm like, what? I'm, I'm right in the front. She says, I need to talk to you. She comes over and she says, listen, um, Ted Cruz isn't coming because there's a bunch of protesters, some anti-Trump folks that are over here, you know, protesting Trump or something. Um, so Ted Cruz isn't coming. I'm like, oh, God, that sucks. And she's like, yeah, you're going to take his spot. You're on in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so it's, as, much, as much time as I spent working on Toastmasters, there's no Toastmaster manual that you can deal with where people are, you know, shouting F you and flipping you the bird. <laughs> um, wow. Like, there's no practice for that, you know? No. Yeah, so but it does make you a better man. It does. It was it was great. It's one of these things I can check off the resume. Yeah. Speak at a rally on the Supreme Court steps. Give an impromptu speech. Yeah. On your resume. Yeah. So that is good, actually, because, I, you know, when I, I talk to students about that, because one of the things I teach is project management. And you do a lot of presentation type stuff and you're not always presenting the friendly crowds. You know, if you ever mm. work on a project that's not going well and, uh, you know, doing defense stuff, which is what I did most of my career. It's, you know, not only are they unfriendly, but they're really smart and unfriendly. So, uh, so yeah, you develop skill at that. That should be a, a Toastmaster uh, module, I think. Requirement. I, I, I think so, too. I mean, man. <laughs> so, the, so the people, the people were, these were protesters? That were, this wasn't Amanda that was. That was so, no, 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 and, gosh. Yeah, she's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> right, I don't know. I mean, she's, no, these, know, the, she can get a little the, spicy. I don't know, you know? She, <laughs> she the protesters was there because it was, uh, I think the travel bans that, that Trump uh, – that went to the Supreme Court, the travel bans were uh, legal, and there were protesters that were, were – people that were protesting that, that travel bans were legal. So they, they had their own area where they were carrying on, and they just kind of spilled over into our area. And um, it was kind of interesting for a while. So I'm guessing that most of the people that, that were against the travel bans – are also against <laughs> Gun the ownership. Second yeah. Amendment, mm -hmm. so they, it was just kind of a twofer for them. They just had all kinds of stuff to complain about. Yeah, it's a bogo. <laughs> so that's good. Actually, that's a good way to segue into the other thing too, because I know you do a lot of uh, Second Amendment activism type stuff, right? Aside from just you know interviewing uh, gun people and stuff with your um, riding shotgun with Charlie, what other kind of stuff do you do Second Amendment activism wise? So I've, um, I really am a lucky son of a gun. I've, uh, having writing shotguns gives me the opportunity to meet a lot of movers and shakers. So I've been speaking at the Gun Rights Policy Conference since 2016. Uh, the day before Gun Rights Policy Conference is this thing called AMCON. It's the Alternative Multimedia Conference. And I've started being a speaker at that uh, since 2017, every year that they've done that. Um, and that's like hanging out with Amanda uh, she she really is she really is awesome. She's like, hey, we're doing a concealed carry fashion show. Do you want to, uh, you know, do you want to, <laughs> do you want to do this? And, and we we emceed a concealed carry fashion show in Cleveland one year for her group, and then for the Second Amount, uh, Amendment Foundation, we've done it in, in Dallas and Chicago and Phoenix. Uh, we did one in Florida. We've done one the last couple of years at this thing called the Rod of Iron event, which is at the Tommy Gun Warehouse. It's put on by Car Arms, so we've done one there. And, um, it's, it's really, it's really cool. Like I, 
I love all this. I love all the stuff I do that's Second Amendment related and, and, you know, speaking at places and doing shows like this. I, I absolutely love it. So you're right. You are a lucky guy. You haven't run across any uh, anybody from the original Red Dawn movie by chance, have you? That, I have you know, not. Michael well, perked right up. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's hear, ears just perked up. I've, I've only heard John Milius on with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with John Milius, man. As a legend. If I, can get, if I can get him in the car, we can talk Dirty Harry. We can talk all sorts of stuff. You, you know, uh, that, hey, I got, might, yeah, I might actually be able to do that. Hey, he'll trade Let's, you a Corolla for, no, I would use the <laughs> for word Amelius. Corolla. Yeah. All right. So, Deputy like editor he, of Marine Corps Gazette, Vic Rubel, is in the studio, and we're going to interview him next. But first, do you have jewelry you don't wear anymore? Well, Leo Hamels just doesn't sell jewelry. They'll buy your jewelry, diamonds, gold, silver, flatware, coins. You name it, if it's you know jewelry, he'll take a look at it. And he'll pay you right on the spot. They'll even buy broken equ- uh, jewelry. So here's an idea. idea. Sell the jewelry and buy yourself a gun. And when you sell, Leo ha- or sell to Leo Hamill, not only will you get a best deal in town, you'll also be supporting a Second Amendment. Support the companies that support the Second Amendment. Call 619-299-1500. Or you can visit their website at leohamill.com to find a jewelry buying location near you. Always get awesome service with Leo's. 619-299-1500. So normally he's on the East Coast in the Washington, D.C. area, and he is the deputy editor of the Marine Corps Gazette. But we uh, we convinced him to come out to uh, the West Coast. And, yeah, you uh, really put a hard bargain on me. I really <laughs> did. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's tough. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. You bet, Vic. So, tell us uh, tell us what you do. First, let's talk about what is the Marine Corps Gazette. So, the Marine Corps Gazette is one of two publications offered through the Marine Corps Association. The Marine Corps Association is the um, professional uh, organization for Marine Corps mm-hmm. uh, that's not associated with the Marine Corps, if that makes any sense. So, um, so the most unofficial... Official. Or, I'm sorry, the most official, official unofficial, unofficial organization right. associated go. with the Marine Corps. Um, so, uh, whereas we don't necessarily fall under like DOD guidelines or whatever, what, you know, what we do is continue that professionalism, the discourse. Uh, we offer tools towards uh, professional military education, uh, sponsor events, and things of that nature. So it's a uh, nonprofit um, that's associated with the Marine Corps, but we don't uh, like take orders from the commandant or anything. That's awesome. What's your what's your role there? What do you do? What do you actually, what, what is it you'd say you, you do here? Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, so uh, I am the deputy editor, of, as you mentioned, of the Gazette, which is one of the two uh, publications that the Marine Corps Association uh, publishes. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also the creative content coordinator, and which led me into podcasting, and I'm a co-host of the Marine Corps Association's podcast, Scuttlebutt. Awesome. And you have, uh, you were saying that you're, uh, one of the things you're going to do on the West Coast out here is, we had a guest, I don't know, a month ago or so, um, Benji. Yeah, You're, Benji Manabog. Yeah, I'm uh, interviewing him on the, this week, so I'm really looking forward to that. That's awesome. Um Looking forward to uh, getting a lot of credit for that when you're on the air. Anyway, so <laughs> <Absolutely>. we're <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm happy to. That guy's awesome. I think you guys are going to have a great. Interview. Yeah, just in what you know, I've I've been in touch with him just a little bit. He's yeah. been uh, just an absolute. I mean, the nicest guy. Yeah. And then looking at his his background and stuff, I'm really looking forward to uh, spending some time with him. He's. What's your background? How did you get into this? So I I'm a Marine. I retired in 2018. Um, uh, nothing is like cool as Benji, uh, but I did do four uh, tours overseas. Um, I'm an AM tracker, for those who don't know. Uh, it's like basically the tanks that go in water. Oh, cool. Um, so we work a lot with the Navy. Those big, I thought, the, like, thought you rode trains a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's not an AM tracker. It's an AAV, uh, the uh, amphibious assault vehicle. Like those big square looking? Big square looking things. Now they're on wheels, mm. and but, you know, I'm a dinosaur. Uh, I was on tracks, but now they're on wheels. Um, but yeah, we go on the ships. Uh, we take infantrymen uh, from ship to shore, and then objectives inland. Um, for half of my career, though, we were in the desert, so I mostly did infantry work. We, uh, we stopped using Amtrak's uh, pretty much around the oh four, oh five, oh six time frame. So, yo, did you join right out of high school, or? Yeah, no, I went to college. So, um, as I think we mentioned earlier, I went to San Clemente High School. Yep. Um, and then I went to Whittier College up in Los Angeles, yeah. 
and just went, they have a program called the Platoon Leaders Course. So I went between my junior and senior years of college, I went to OCS in Virginia. Wow. Came back. Uh, I was playing football uh, for Whittier. So I didn't do a lot of like the uh, the X's and O's stuff in the summer to get ready for my senior well, year. D- different set of X's but and I was, O's, right? I had a lot of endurance, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I could outrun everybody. Uh, but there was some catching up to do. Um, so, yeah, I finished out my um, my senior year and then commissioned on the day of graduation as a second lieutenant. Oh, that's then, awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. You, you, how, many, you, how, many, how many years were you in the Marine Corps? Uh, 20, yeah. So that was 97. So, um, you know, it was Clinton era. You were, like, high speed if you went and, like, handed out humanitarian rations in some, you know, in a country that had had a humanitarian crisis or some disaster relief. Well. Like, well, wow, that's real world action. And then 9 Three years later. Yeah, fast forward. <laughs> Um, as I'm sitting in the common area of the barracks watching, you know, the towers fall and everyone going, you know, shouting, get to the armory. Because mm. I was at Camp Pendleton, for those who don't, aren't aware, where we were at in Camp Pendleton is right off the five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we're just up the street from San Onofre. Mm-hmm. And so, like, get to the armory. This is happening. So that's how you can tell he's a real Cali- Californian, that he hasn't been tainted by the East Coast the too five? much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, no, it's, it's, it's in the blood. It's in the marrow. Yeah. Like that, he may five. go there, yeah. but he always comes yeah, back. I live there, but yeah. this is my home. How many, sure. how many times have you said, man, I, I miss in and out And every all your all the other Marines uh, looked what, at you and were like, what? Yeah, what day is it? <laughs> 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 just, I, I, I think I have alarm set the one I was just most, yeah. supposed to tell someone about in and out and they try so hard to, to replicate that burger. They yeah, they've try got five so, guys. They've yeah, got they a got, couple, but it's not. Yeah, it's yeah, not. It doesn't right do there it. Somebody said water, what a burger in nah, Texas. Not even close. Yeah, yeah. that's, yeah, that's, that's, I haven't had one yet. We I, tried I, that when we were storm chasing. We hit a couple of those. And, did you? Uh, yeah, they were okay, but they were not, that's not. But it wasn't in and out. out. No, no in and out. Yeah, it's just. So what, uh, what, what kind of what do you what are you looking to accomplish with with the podcast? It, it's you know the, the everything's changing, right? Like the internet changed everything about fifteen years ago. Yeah, and then so it was interesting when I came on board. They had the sound studio, and there was the idea for the podcast. And you know, being the creative content guy, I figured, oh, this is probably something I should help move along. I had zero intention of being the host. So we go through all the stuff. You know, I'm the ideas guy. Hey, here's the thing. Everybody's like getting motivated. Like, yeah, this could really work. Keep talking. And I'm like, all right, so who are we going to have as the host? And they're like, what do you mean? (laughs) You. We're like, no. You just built it. Uh, Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was like, well, I'll tell you what. I'll do it for a little bit until you guys figure out somebody to come in. And like, why are we already paying you? How many years is a little bit? How long has it been? (laughs) Yeah. So we're on our, uh, gosh, I should know this. It's like the 27th episode. We've been doing it since like August. So we're still very much in the uh, the. Well, it's a good thing you just did it for a short time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a man of your word. Yeah, yeah, right. So you described, we were talking about uh, Benji, and we were talking about some of the other folks that you want to get on, some of the storytelling that you do. And and you described it uh, perfectly when we were off the air. Yeah, so this is going to be a. This is gonna, I'm going to totally punt it now. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about what the what the goal is. Yeah, so I guess the yeah, the bumper sticker uh, that we go with is stories matter. And um, you know, I, I uh, after I retired, I went to American University, uh, got my master's in creative writing, and so I was very interested in storytelling. Obviously, it's something that I think narrative drives a lot of what we do politics and religion and I mean everything has a narrative arc and so one of the things I noticed as I was looking at the bookshelves was is that the stories that were being told or the or the things the gatekeepers were allowing to go on the shelves were medal of honor winners or then some you know hardcore commander of some task force that does stuff at night and snatches up bad guys and those are all great stories obviously they're very exciting and they're uplifting sort of but it, it's like 1.1% of what people do. And I mean, we've been at war for 12 years. Not everybody got a Medal of Honor. Not everybody commanded some high-speed task force. But everything that everyone did mattered. If you stood post, you kept people alive while you were standing post. Or if you just patrolled every day, you kept bad guys from attacking or kept people from harassing or kept the murder intimidation campaigns or whatever it was, we were together, we were in a brotherhood in arms, and what you did mattered, and so let's talk about those stories. And so we started looking at what people were doing either while they were in, when they got out, 
Benji's a great example. What happened before they were Marines? Yeah. And what was that path? What was that journey like? And we just started to see like these really rich, deep, like really profound and engaging stories. And so we're like, let's just tell those. We don't have to not everybody has to be the guy who killed bin Laden. Like And every things- soldier, male or female, has that same story. Absolutely. So your content list is it goes long. on and on. Yeah, and it I grows just, just, every time somebody yeah. joins the military. Do you remember going in the bus to the recruiting office to get your hair shaved? I mean, the, the first place for the exam. Yes, yeah, so I was, remember that as good. Yeah, I can remember looking out the window and I could see it. And I'm thinking, what the hell did I just yeah, do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, luckily I, I played football, so the yelling part wasn't oh, that big yeah, of a yeah, deal. Yeah. So I was, oh no, that I was didn't ready. bother. I had a father. Yeah. And then I, same I thing that you know. I always had short hair, so that wasn't the biggest thing. That well, honestly, killed me. My hair was on my shoulders. <laughs> I got one of the biggest butt chewings at, at the OCS that I ever got when they were doing the, the commander's inspection there yeah. towards the end. Yeah. And he starts asking every, you know, goes every other guy, whatever. Hey, what what did you, what was the thing you disliked the most about being here? And most be like, ah, oh, the drill or the running. Yeah. Everybody had sort of their templated answer. And I was like waking up in the morning <laughs> like i am not a morning person so having to get up at five in the morning and then like start your day that was the worst part the pt i could handle the yelling i could handle short haircuts fine but yeah wake up in should the morning if I, there's a five in the morning i didn't have, I had no yeah, idea you should have asked if maybe there was like a second shift marine corps <laughs> You're right like is there a night thing where yeah. I could do? and so yeah as soon as the uh, the colonel left the air because he was just like all right good to go candidate whatever and so, as soon as i left they were just like on me like <sighs> You know, starving dogs on hamburger. as they normally <laughs> yeah, do. Like, but the, 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 one of the, the way the you pit. phrase that, I really want to make sure that 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 that, uh, that this is said. You, you said that you know, hearing all these very you know, truly impressive. Not to take anything away from some of these award winners and you know, whatever the guy. For that sure. Them, but mean, you said, what, what did you say about that? Yeah, I mean, these stories mattered because. But what did it make? It made you feel. It made me feel like what I was, what I did, or what other people had done didn't. It didn't matter, like wow. we because you know we were at war for twelve years, yeah. but because no one cares about what I did, you know maybe in a bar someone says, "Hey, let me buy you a beer," which is a great. And I'm not, I'm trying to downplay that at all, but when the constant narrative is, "Hey, we only care about these guys because they got medals," yeah. it really devalues. No, that else and you know, I think I, that's awesome, and I don't agree with that. I really don't. I think every single person in the core matters. Right. Yeah, but I'm glad you're telling the stories. But we're going to talk and, to you And, and we don't want to downplay a free beer either. No, no, you don't you bring any? So or let's... more. Yeah, or more. <laughs>
Do you guys know each other? I don't. Only know of. Yeah. Oh, okay. Obviously, right. Nancy speaks very highly. So. So you wrote an article, my friend. We're not going to try to stump you this uh, this week. We're giving you a bunch of time to talk about the article that you wrote and got published. Congratulations. Yeah. Drive some readers to the articles. So so talk yeah. about what, what was the catalyst? What made you write the article? Um, so this is actually my third uh, feature article for Leatherneck Magazine. Um, the, the, the story behind why this article came into being is sort of convoluted, but basically um, it was a, a half-formed episode for an abortive podcast project that never went anywhere. Um, and this was like three years ago that I put this together. And I just had it sitting on the, the hard drive of my old laptop tucked away until um, uh, my mom, your sister, uh, at, at Leatherneck came to me and, and belly ached that there was an absolutely horrendous uh, piece that they didn't want to run. And so they were looking for – and some other stuff fell through and they had a gap. And so she asked if I still had these scripts lying around, and I went – well, yeah, I could I could spruce them up and make something out of them, and so uh, that ended up turning into two articles, um, in addition to one that I had already written, and this uh, it it's it's an interesting read, I think. That's an enormously open and honest explanation. Of I don't <laughs> think that came I, about. <laughs> I don't think I could have ever done it any better. <laughs> trust me. So, the, but the cool thing about the reason I wanted wanted people to know that it started out as as a script for a podcast is. Uh, the article reads more like I don't know, maybe more conversational. Is that is, what do you think, Sam? Is that a good description? Yeah, I think it sort of um, it's it's not quite the same as my usual writing style. Um, What's your? How do you describe your usual I writing style? The alphabet was much more my style because I wrote it from the beginning to be published in the magazine. Yeah, but this one uses shorter words. I changed the sentence structure a little bit. So that it reads more in a conversational tone. Well, both have their strengths, but I thought that that particular I thought it was very strong when you're when you're in in this particular article. So, what's the article about? Um, it is the second installment in a series called "This Is My Rifle," and um, it, it's a series about the small arms of the U.S. Marine Corps. And this one is about the famous M1 rifle. Famous M1. What's the rest of that? Uh, Garand. Garand. See that? Yeah, Vic, we were just talking we're about. talking about Garand. It's <laughs> maybe clearly it's spelled. Weren't you Garand, guys discussing but, that word earlier? We were just talking about the that. The Grand. I, I, yeah, I, that's what people would, oh. most people would call it, the Grand. Now, how yeah. do you know that's how it's uh, pronounced? Funny, kind of little known thing. Um, people look at it on paper and say Garand because it looks like that's how it should be pronounced. But um, the, the, the guy himself and his family pronounced it with the emphasis on the first syllable. So um, in deference to that, I, I have been pronouncing it Garand. It's like saying Larry Bird played for the Celtics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what it feels like. All right, okay, so uh, what now talk, what was the most ama- tell us about a little bit about what did you Vic, did you use a, a Garand when you were or no, that was a little <laughs> Man, I'm not that old. All right, I right, just making sure. <laughs> so <laughs> this kid's way younger than you. Let so me when do they uh, what, what was wait, what, it was putting the uh, shot and bug <laughs> yeah, right, powder down exactly. in the barrel, yeah. So um, what 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 was the most basic thing you learned about the uh, the Garand when you were writing it? Um, I, it's hard to pick out one singular most amazing thing because when you when you study something really in depth, uh, especially something that was a, a process instead of a singular event, um, a lot of these really interesting stories come to the surface that just aren't very well known. And there are just so many different fun facts about the development of this rifle. And one of the resources I used because I, I really like to use primary sources um, to, to get the best information possible, was uh, Hatcher's book of the Garand by General Julian Hatcher, who was in the Army. And he worked very closely on the trials process that ultimately ended up adopting uh, the M1 as the first self-loading infantry rifle in U.S. service. And there's, it's, again, I, I can't pick just one, but... Uh, one of my favorite examples is that in the book he talks about efforts by marine armorers at the primary, or, sorry, at the uh, precision weapons section on Quantico, which is right near where I live, 
uh, to accurize the M1 for shooting matches. And the methods he talks about are some of the same stuff we use today. Like he says, for example, you know, the, the hardest thing is betting rifle properly. And what that means is basically making sure that the parts of the barrel and receiver that mate up with the stock have firm and secure contact so that the barrel harmonics aren't disturbed as much. Um, and he says basically, well, the ideal would be to have a free-floated barrel that doesn't touch the stock at any point, but we just really can't do that with modern technology. And as I was reading that, I was actually sitting at work in, in some downtime, and I looked over on the rack, and you know, you can, you can buy an AR-15 for 600 bucks with a free-floated barrel now that'll shoot circles around an accurized M1. Wow. And what, what, when, when did they adopt the, uh, the Garand? 1936. And what did it replace? What, what was before that? It replaced the M1903 Springfield, uh, which was a, a bolt action, basically a, a Mauser copy. When it's funny, so the 1903, uh, 1936, so it had been in service 30 whatever years, right? 33 years? Yeah, more or less. And you think to yourself, man, they hadn't changed their rifle in 30-something years? How long have we been using an AR? Uh, well, since the since about the 1960s, so yeah. we're coming up on almost 60 years now. Isn't that but, amazing? <laughs> but Sam, wouldn't you say if it's not broke? If it's not well, broke? Yeah, uh, if you could say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But yeah. I would I would extend that to be that um, a new weapon system isn't adopted just because it's better than what we already have. It has to be enough better to overcome the advantages of having this well-established supply chain for not just the rifles, but the ammunition, the parts, the tools needed to uh, maintain them, the training for the armorers, the machinery needed to make the tools and the parts to repair the rifles, and all that stuff backing up uh, nearly all the way to the raw materials in some cases. So you, when when you're you're studying um, as as a logistician on some kind of new acquisitions project, you really have to take all those things into consideration. And this is something that uh, that General Hatcher goes into detail in in the book when he talks about how the M1 was originally developed in a new 276, uh, sort of slightly less powerful round. Um, and the idea there was that it would produce less recoil, so it would be easier to shoot, and the ammunition would be a lot lighter, so you'd be able to carry more for the same amount of weight, and it would be less expensive to manufacture. But General MacArthur stepped in at the last minute, and he said basically, well, yeah, this 276 round is great and all, but I insist that this has to be in the standard 30-06 so that you can have compatibility with the machine guns. It's interesting. Vic was n nodding his head the whole time you were talking about why yeah. they replaced. What, what, did, what, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, it was so, uh, you know, obviously we did a lot of embedded partnerships. My last tour, uh, I was actually in uh, the UAE helping train uh, Emiratis, um, and there was a lot of commingling of ammunition and weapon systems, um, especially when you're partnering in country and a host nation that's sort of fallen apart you know I, and i was in afghanistan and iraq doing that kind of work and just logistically trying to support their operations when some guys have 762 other guys have 556 five, some other guys have god knows what they're yeah. <laughs> pulling together uh and then you know tell them to, to we're gonna go do a four-day op and you do a, you know, you're basically doing your pre-combat checks and inspections, and you're like, you got the magazine with the wrong ammo, dude. <laughs> so what was what? So basically, it sounds like you know, it's not just like, hey, we want a neat new toy. Yeah, it's, I mean, it really has more to do with logistics, and it boils down to even something as simple as like the technical manuals. Hmm. You got to change them if you're going to change out. You know, like Sam was saying, I mean, a lot of moving parts. It's a lot to consider to to adopt a new set of moving parts. A lot of moving parts. So what, again, it falls right back into if it's not broke, don't you know? You don't need to fix it. You know, Kalishnikov, I mean, that's why Kalishnikov's been around for yeah, a long, yeah. long, long It may long not time. be the best, it may not be the greatest, but if you're going to come up with something that's ten times full and it's going to make a lot of money and save a lot of lives, then you do it, right, Sam? Right, and to your point about the M16, the M16s in service aren't the same ones we've been rocking since no. Vietnam. No, they have yeah. taken the same platform and adapted it because it's way easier to maintain the same basic weapon right. 
and just change this out, change that small feature out to modernize it instead of just adopting a completely new thing. Right. They're more better. By the way, Dave is tainting the minds of the youth <laughs> off air. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I love him. Hey, if you were wondering who that voice is, because we've never, ever, 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 ever said who the answer guy is. Have Should we, we keep it quiet? No, we everybody. Should everybody, we tell it? No, they don't. At the, know. at the monthly meetings, people come up and ask. I've seen them in public. People come up and ask them to say the answer. That's our man, yeah, Action, Action Jackson. Jackson. We yeah. got to do another do another uh, episode of You Don't Know Jack. So. Yeah, what? What? You, you quit writing? Uh, well, we just. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah, wanna, but we're saving it up. All right, hey folks, what a shout out to Brian from Wild Built Tactical. We want to thank you for supporting our show. And sharing it on our newsletter. Hey, Wild Built Tactical is the go-to source for California legal rifles, pistols, and shotguns. Go visit them online at wbtguns.com. Or stop by their store in La Mesa. Yeah, Brian's got a great store in La Mesa, but check him out online. He's uh, he's promoting Gun Owners Radio on, cool. on his newsletter, and he's just a great guy. So thank you so much, Brian. All right, let's get back to Sam the Man in this cr- man. Yeah, this- cool article, right, dude? I'm I'm literally mesmerized. So he wrote an article on the Garens, and we were where we were just we were just talking about. Dave was saying if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. So what was broke uh, about the Springfield 1903 that the Garand fixed? Well, um, military strategist uh, military strategists were aware um, at least as early as World War I, some of them even before that. But during the First World War, they realized that if, uh, on, on the rare occasion that a rifleman would have an enemy combatant in his sights, he would basically only get one shot. Because in the time it takes to work the bolt on a, on a conventional bolt-action rifle, um, if, if you haven't hit then uh, the person you were shooting at has gotten his head out of the line of fire. And so they realized that soldiers could produce a much greater volume of fire with something self-loading. And machine guns had already established their presence on the battlefield as a really revolutionary technology. So they were looking to figure out a way to bring that, uh, that type of firepower into the hand of the individual soldier. Uh, the problem was, well, there, there were a number of problems. But uh, a lot of them came down to durability and lightweight. So you can, you can start with a belt-fed machine gun and then just try and cut things away to make it smaller and lighter. But the result is never small enough and light enough and simple enough to mass produce at low cost and be able to field as a replacement for a bolt-action rifle. Uh, another direction you can, you can approach the problem from, and I talk about this a little bit in the article, is that you can start with some kind of a civilian hunting rifle because, believe it or not, civilians were using semi-automatic box magazine-fed rifles in the teens and 20s. Uh, this, is, this is not some kind of new technology. Um, it, you, can, you can sort of take that type of a weapon and try and make it into a military arm by redesigning it for a more powerful uh, military cartridge. But that never really worked out because these designs weren't robust and reliable enough for field conditions. Basically, they weren't soldier-proof and the actions weren't strong enough to handle a more powerful round. And so it took a lot of really designing from the ground up on the part of a, a number of very talented firearms designers to produce weapons that really were uh, usable as military rifles and were durable enough to withstand abuse and were inexpensive enough to manufacture by the millions. And I, I go through all of this in, in some detail, but just to give you some perspective, John Guerin started designing self-loading rifles in about 1919. His rifle wasn't adopted until 1936. So that's a time span of about 17 years, uh, if, if I've done my, my mental arithmetic correctly. Yep, I checked it. Um, that it, it took for, for him to get from a working prototype to a working military arm. That's interesting. So how successful was it? In general, how, what, 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 what reputation, and not just the reputation, but how successful was the, the, the Garand? Well, they were produced from 1936 to 1945, and then again for a couple of years in the early 50s. Total production numbers ended up somewhere in the neighborhood of 5.5 million 
It was the standard infantry rifle of the U.S. Army and Marine Corps from 1936 to supposedly 1957, but some were still in frontline use later than that, and some were used in training environments even beyond uh, well into the 60s. Uh, many were shipped to foreign countries as aid after the Second World War, so um, Greece, Turkey, some other European powers, um, Italy actually had a bunch of them. Um, a, a lot of different countries received M1s as aid, um, and so it was not just uh, not just used by the Americans. That's why you know the the civilian marksmanship program. That's why every I don't know every few years. I, I guess I haven't seen this in a while, but every, it seemed like back in the 90s and early 2000s, every few years they'd crack open some new warehouse in Greece or Turkey. They'd find uh, you know 10,000. <laughs> Uh, Garens that were soaking in oil, and then boom, they'd ship them back to the U.S. and and uh, and and they CMP would would distribute them. Uh, yeah, a fair number of them are still floating around out there. Um, a lot of surplus ammo is still uh, out there to be found. Of course, not as much as there was maybe 20 years ago. Uh, the days of that being a really uh, cheap option to shoot uh, have have kind of gone away. But um, there there is still some surplus out there. So what were some of the drawbacks of, of the Garand? How come they weren't still using a Garand when, when Vic was going through? Uh, when he I think they the just started phasing him out. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it weighs nine and a half pounds, and it holds eight rounds of thirty out six. And um, so the, the obvious improvements are, first of all, make it smaller and lighter because every pound of weight that you, that you shave off on the, the rifle – is another pound of ammunition that you can carry. Um, and it also makes the rifle handier and easier to maneuver in close quarters, uh, like in an urban environment or in dense jungle, as we would find out in Vietnam. Um, another, another improvement you can make is that instead of using an internal magazine fed from, uh, fed, fed from N-block clips, you can switch to using a detachable box magazine like the BAR was doing. And uh, so you can increase the capacity and make it a little bit quicker and easier to reload. Um, you can add a selector switch for what that's worth. Um, the, the M14 had that, and it was not often used as far as I'm aware. Uh, in fact, the M14 was actually pretty much an evolution of the M1. The gas yeah. is different. The receiver is a little different. But it started with experiments at, I believe, Winchester. Well... Yeah, Winchester and Springfield in about 1944-1945 on uh, how to improve on the basic design. Uh, it wasn't really until the M16 that we got something that was really uh, substantially different in a lot of ways. And uh, actually, my previous This Is My Rifle piece was on the M16. Yeah, a lot of people don't know the, the very tight connection between the M14 and the M1 Garand, um, but it's uh, it was a, a kind of a... A development of, um, but yeah. So I, the the Garand was was I think inarguably extremely successful as far as as firearms go, uh, and I don't think anybody would want any other. Like for example, if you're wanting to get someone off your lawn, um, I there think there, there's, well, it's iconic too because they still use it ceremonially. I mean, yeah, if yeah. you go to Eighth and I and DC, the, all the yeah, dress. all of the silent drill teams still so, use it. So M1. Sam, let me ask you a question: between the M1 and the M14, which was the heaviest? Uh, the M1 weighed about a pound more, okay. um, give or take, depending on the okay. exact cut of wood in the stock. Because I, I was in, talk about age, when we used the M14s. You know, we didn't have anything but those. And I know that freaking thing was heavy. Well, they actually still use those. Oh, no, no, I a know, I know, I know. I, well, I don't know about I today, thought, but as late I as I never the fired 90s. an M1, but I was very, very happy with the M14. I didn't have any complaints. You can still buy one. You should, you should buy one. I should. I'll bet you can get one from Wild Bill Tactical, actually. I think I got to go back and see Sam. Is it on the list? Yeah. Oh, and uh, from <laughs> We're his in shop? California. Yeah, I think, I think you probably, well, you might have to alter it a little bit, but. I'm not well, I think it. that's, it, the article's awesome. I think we've definitely. Congratulations, uh, Sam. the interest. I think what we're going to do is we're actually going to send this link, or send a link to the article out. Is that is that cool? Can we send this out to uh, promote Leatherneck in your article? Yeah, it works for me. Sounds good. And if from a 30-plus year radio guy, revisit the, the podcast because you are amazing. You can keep somebody glued to their speaker 
for as long as you want to hang on to them. And I'm telling you that has been doing this for many, many, many years because you're very informational. You can archive them. You can put them in like in a library, what people want to talk about because you're very topic focused. Just thought I'd say it on air so you won't forget. He's got the looks for a podcast, too. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. I, I got re- to recycle that. But he'll make you sit there and listen to the whole thing. I mean, you don't he's an drift amazing off. guy. I, 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 no, I'm, and he's not even my relative. I think it, I was going to say, I think it's in the DNA. No, it's not. I think it is. But, but uh, it's on your sister's side. But it's on, it? <laughs> well, she's my sister. Yeah, I know. But you, yeah. She took it all. We're you on got the same nothing. side. No, she took it all. Trust me. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome job, Sam. Thank yeah. you so much. Excellent. Vic, what did you think of that, man? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's so, uh, really great that this kind of material is coming out At of... his age. Yeah. At his, his age. age. He's like 10 years older. Well, I mean, just you know, being a, a, an MFA guy, anytime someone's writing, I'm like really yeah. pumped because it's yeah. just a dying art. Yeah, I know. Um, How do people find the Gazette if they want yeah. to read more? Oh, same place. So uh, MCA, so that's uh, phonetically, it's uh, Mike Charlie Alpha dash Marines dot org. Um, and if you look on there, you'll see both the publications. We have a lot of other resources, tools. Uh, we have tactical decision games for those who are in who want to do kind of war gaming type stuff, archives, articles, and we have a battle studies package. So if you're in an area and there's a battle, do you want a tour? You can check out our website. There'll wow. be a bunch of information there to help you oh, that's get cool. spun up. For, I didn't yeah. know about that. That's yeah, awesome. Is that, of... that something you worked on? Uh, well, I, I, I am working on it currently, but it was <laughs> already cool. established. Very yeah. good. That's, that's cool. Take, ah, credit take the it. credit. Yeah, the yeah, it was me. Of course Come it was on, me. I did of course it. it was me. Hey, it. hey, folks, go out there and take care of all our sponsors. San Diego County Gun Owners and Inland Empire Gun Owners. The Dillon Law Group, PRMI Mortgage. Sage Tree Digital Marketing, CL1. Leo Hamill, Fine Jewelry. San Diego Flight Training International. Thanks to Joe Dramisi, Michael Schwartz, Sam the Gunman, Brendan Thomas, and Action Jackson. FM 961 AM 1170. The Answer.